Hello everyone, I'm Katie Contos and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with Enerdata. Today's webinar is focused on determining future energy efficiency potential across sectors. Case study on Germany. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. The audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center Resource Library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentation from our guest panelist, Dr. Manfred Hoffner, who has joined us to discuss the main energy efficiency drivers at sectoral and end, end use levels and their impact on future energy conception. Before we jump into the presentation, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then following the panelist presentation, we'll have a question and answer session where the panelist will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll automatically be prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries and the European Commission are members covering 90% of the clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through the support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the Government of Chile. The Solution Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to government and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual, virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy policy topics, partnership building with development agency and regional and global organizations to deliver support in an online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools and videos and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from government and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with private sector NGOs and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across its suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include organizations like IRENA, IEA, and programs like se for all and regional focus entities such as ECOWAS, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature that the Solution Center provides is a no-cost expert policy known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policy makers with one, more than 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of energy efficiency programs, we are very pleased to have Benjamin Kernier, Associate Director of Southern African Carbon Trust, serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in energy efficiency programs or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. 
Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online, online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to provide a brief introduction for today's panelists. Our panelist is Dr. Manfred Hafner, who is a partner and vice president of consulting at Enerdata. Dr. Hafner is recognized expert on energy scenario building, supply demand assessment, energy policy analysis, market and strategy studies on all energy sources with specific focus on gas and power markets. During his almost 30 years of working in that field of energy, in which he has consulted extensively for energy companies, governments, and international organizations, he has gained considerable worldwide working experience, and in particular on European, Middle Eastern, North African, Russian, and CIS markets. And now with that brief introduction, I'd like to welcome Manfred to the webinar. Manfred? Yes. Hello. Good, uh, good afternoon or good morning for our friends in the US. Um, I'm going to, to talk about uh, how to determine uh, and uh, our exercise at Enerdata on determining future energy efficiency potential across sectors with a case study for Germany. First of all, a few words about uh, Enerdata for those of you who should not uh, know us even though I think uh, most people will know us. Enerdata is a global energy intelligence company. It is uh, independent. It is not related to any governmental organization or um, company interest. It is uh, indeed a, a spin-off of a uh, public research center in France. It has a global outreach. Its experts, uh, it has a lot of uh, experts, some 40 people, who do analysis and forecasting of global energy and climate issues. We do have in-house uh, globally recognized uh, databases and uh, forecasting models. I'm going to talk about uh, some of them today. We are headquartered in uh, Grenoble in the French Alps, uh, but we have offices uh, in Paris, in London, in Singapore, and uh, we have uh, a global reach in the sense that our clients are in Europe, but in Asia, in the Americas, in Africa, and we, we work uh, globally. Um, the, 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 one of the uh, most important issues of Enerdata is it's an energy uh, information and energy consulting company. Now, uh, today I'm going to talk about energy efficiency scenarios, the case study on Germany. Uh, first, a few slides on Germany. Uh, what is uh, Germany? Germany is the largest, uh, uh, the largest uh, country in uh, Europe, in Western Europe. Uh, it is the largest country as far as the population is concerned, as far as GDP is concerned, and it is the largest energy consumer in Europe. It uh, has launched, uh, it is a quite an interesting country because it has a very ambitious policy on energy transition towards uh, low carbon policies. Uh, it has launched in 2010 its energy concept, which is a comprehensive strategy with a long-term pathway to 2050 in order to decarbonize its economies. The goal is to become one of the world's most energy efficient and environmentally friendly economies. Uh, the policy is mainly based on uh, promoting renewable energy, which is as a cornerstone for future supply. Uh, but obviously also energy efficiency is an important uh, part of the policy. Now when the, in 2010 this energy concept was developed, the idea was to uh, phase out the phase out of uh, nuclear, which had been decided by a previous uh, uh, red green government under Schroeder and uh, the Greens and, and the idea here was to to uh, postpone this nuclear phase out but then in 2011 as you know in March 11th of March of 2011 the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident happened and Germany did a second uh, uh, 
U-turn uh, undoing this policy of the four of the 2010 year and uh, therefore phasing out uh, deciding to phase out all nuclear power plants in Germany even much faster than originally planned and by 2022. So the idea is that by 2022 there will be no more nuclear power plant in Germany um, while uh, traditionally nuclear represented about uh, 20 to 25 percent of uh, the power generation mix therefore making it even more difficult this energy transition uh, because obviously nuclear is uh, uh, has a positive impact on, on nuclear on uh, the uh, energy transition on low carbon uh, uh, transition to low carbon mix and therefore renewables became even more important as did uh, energy efficiency so far nine nuclear power plants have already been shut down since uh, 2011 now in 2011 we have therefore the second energy package which we call Energiewende or in English en energy transition with seven legislative measures measures to support it one a very strong access uh, and focus as I said on renewable energy second uh, on grid expansion because this is what you need in order to integrate the renewables third very important promote to promote energy efficiency and uh, uh, how to fund the reforms and then to phase out the nuclear by 2022, as I already said. As far as energy efficiency targets are concerned, the, the targets are as follows. By 2020, decision was taken in 2011 to have a reduction compared to 2008 by 20% of uh, primary energy demand in 2020 and by 50% by 2050. So by 2050, the idea was is that uh, you are only allowed to consume 50% less energy that you consumed in 2008, but obviously you still want to increase GDP, you still want to, to have a, a wealthier society and a wealthier country. As far as electricity consumption is concerned, reduction levels are much more modest. Why? Because uh, the energy transition goes hand in hand with an electrification of uh, the uh, energy mix and therefore you will move more more towards electricity also because uh, the renewables are very to a large extent uh, uh, power based just like wind energy solar energy and therefore uh, pv energy pv cells and solar and therefore uh, the energy transition goes hand in hand with an increased electricity demand. So the electricity demand reduction by 2020 compared to 2008 will be by 10% and by 2050 compared to 2008 by 25%. Half the level, half the, the shares, the reduction compared to primary energy demand. Now the sectorial targets for the building sector, for instance, decision was taken to make a very strong effort on building renovation on the old uh, building stocks to renovate uh, not one as was previously thought was was the previous target but now two percent per year of the building stock to renovate it every year obviously this is extremely important because yes it is important to have uh, uh, building codes for new buildings and Germany has very advanced building codes for new buildings but uh, you also need to address the existing buildings in existing cities this is much more expensive and difficult but so the the uh, aim was to double the effort and to reduce therefore heating requirements compared to 2005 by 20 percent in 2020 and that by 80 percent in 2050 in other words in 2050 uh, uh, the country should only consume 20% of uh, uh, energy for heating purposes uh, compared to 2005. Also in the transportation sector, very important reductions, but obviously as we know it's much more difficult to implement reductions at least in the short run because internal combustion engine is uh, still there and uh, even though uh, efficiency improvements are expected and so by 2020 the target is to have a 10 percent reduction in the consumption of the transport sector uh, and uh, 
40 percent by 2050 but compared to 2005. How to do that? Well, the government provided the two billion per year uh, funding for the CO2 building renova renovation program, which was financed by the uh, KFW energy efficiency building and refurbishment funding programs. Also, in uh, 2009 first and then in 2014, thermal standards for new buildings have been strongly uh, improved and uh, new regulation was also introduced to uh, replace from 2015 on all oil and gas boilers which are more than 30 years old because the new ones they have much better energy efficiency standards and and to implement uh, for all new buildings by 2020 the climate neutral building standards so very aggressive very very strong policies to reduce uh, uh, emissions and, and in particular here to promote energy efficiency. Now I'm going to, to say a few words on Enerdata's country energy demand forecasts. I give you a, a service description of what we do. Now we, we have, as I told you before, we have different models. Here we use a, a specific model which we called Metpro, which is a bottom-up, uh, very detailed uh, model to uh, allow uh, to, to, to do energy demand forecasts by country, but uh, also, if necessary, by region inside a country um, up to 2030, 2040. In this case, we do it up to 2035. And in this case, we, so this model is, uh, can, is by sector and by end use, as we will see. And in uh, this service, uh, we provide two scenarios, a reference scenario, which is a scenario based on uh, the country um, targets and plans and an energy efficiency scenario which is a much more uh, um, focused uh, scenario promoting even more energy efficiency in the different countries. So far the, this service covers six uh, European uh, countries. They uh, are uh, Germany, France, Spain, the UK, Italy and Belgium. But obviously other countries can uh, be uh, addressed and uh, we can develop scenarios for other countries, as indeed we do on an on, uh, on, uh, ad hoc basis. The, the particularity and the very interesting thing of this uh, service is that it allows to do sensitivity analysis on some key drivers. So yes, there are two different scenarios, a reference scenario and the energy efficiency scenario, but then the user is able to play around some specific key drivers as we will see later on, either uh, re related to the macroeconomic scenarios or demography or energy prices or the model shift the energy efficiency in buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, a few words on the, the model, which we have developed in-house. Um, Enerdata uh, exists for about 30 years, and this is also the 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 uh, from the very beginning. Enerdata has worked on this model, Metpro, which originally was called uh, Mede, but uh, it's a, it's a model which uh, exists since the mid 1970s and and which has been further developed by experts uh, who uh, worked at Enerdata or still work at Enerdata it's a technical economic model it has been used uh, worldwide in about 60 60 countries to provide energy demand forecast and analysis by various actors of the energy sector we have worked for uh, companies, for governments, for policymakers, and uh, fundamentally this model, METPRO, allows to do energy demand uh, long-term forecasts by sector and end use up to 2040 and also to calibrate other scenarios which are uh, top-down scenarios which do not have such a detailed uh, bottom-up representation of the energy sector so to calibrate uh, uh, more econometric scenarios on the demand of our uh, very detailed uh, metpro uh, modeling exercise it also allows to evaluate uh, energy efficiency policies um, and measures 
and to calculate specific energy indicators related to energy efficiency, for instance. And finally, it allows to simulate the sector by sector and end use greenhouse gas emissions uh, related to specific policies and to evaluate the specific the strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the demand side. Some re recent references where we have used this model include the uh, French Ministry of the Environment, where we have had the regular um, projects since 2008, but also earlier, the French Energy Efficiency Agency, um, the Tunisian uh, energy, Agen energy Efficiency Agency, the Moroccan Energy Efficiency uh, Agency, the, the Moroccan Ministry of Energy Mines and Water and Environment, the Turkish Ministry of Energy, but these are just the very latest uh, and some examples of references, references on this model we have worldwide. Now just to give you an idea what the type of model and how we have, uh, um, how we have uh, modeled what we are going to present to you for the case of Germany. This is one slide, the last slide on this model, how it works very briefly. There are some input variables. These are socioeconomic variables like GDP, population, value added, energy prices, productivity. And then there are some technological input variables like fuel efficiency, mileage of, uh, of cars and, and, uh, and trucks, new equipment performance and so on. And then there are different modeling options. There's a very flexible disaggreg disaggregation level by branch, by end use, by vehicles, cars, bus, modal, modal transportation and so on, by different zones, of course, but also flexible endogenization of different parameters, like uh, the number of uh, vehicles, production of energy intensive industries, building stocks and so on. And then uh, uh, the output, so the model is sectorial, so there is a sector, there's a transportation sector, industry sector, residential sector, tertiary sector, and agricultural sector, each of which is uh, broken down by end use, like uh, passenger freight by mode, by different modes, or so thermal electricity and non-energy uses, like cooking, hot water, space heating, air conditioning, lighting, or other elect electric uses like thermal and electricity and uses public lighting and so on. Or for the agricultural sector, tractor, tractors, water pumping and so on. So a very, very detailed um, disaggregation of the system. And then as the output, we get energy demand uh, globally. We get some uh, 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 specific uh, uh, outputs by for industrial sector, for, for the transportation sector, for the residential sector, for the tertiary and the agricultural sector, and some very spe some specific consumptions like energy intensive products for vehicle types, end use appliances and so on, and specific indicators like energy intensity, energy expenses by households, for instance, CO2 emissions and others. Now this was just a general introduction and explanation of what kind of model we use. This is a, a model which has been developed by Enerdata experts and by Enerdata itself. And now I'm going to present you uh, the scenarios which we define in general. So this is the reference scenario and the energy efficiency scenario in this uh, in the framework of this uh, um, service. Now, the reference scenario, as I said earlier on, is uh, based on uh, the national targets or the national energy demand outlook based on current trends and existing policies or policies which a country has decided to implement. Uh, it is based on uh, continuous but limited improvements in energy efficiency due to technological progress, but again, based on uh, the targets and objectives of uh, the individual countries. The, the second energy efficiency scenario, which is, a scenario, which is a scenario which has much more ambitious policies, here we, we use the same macroeconomic assumptions as in the reference scenario, but we reinforce uh, the building codes, we reinforce the renovation rate uh, of uh, uh, old buildings, uh, we, we use uh, much more efficient appliances. We try to see how far we can go from, a, from a, uh, using a, a, um, 
an economic optimum, we are not going to, 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 to go to the, to the very maximum you can go, but to, to an economic optimum to push even further than the countries presently do in their policies to see what the potential could be for that. The, the, to improve the industrial processes, obviously, to have uh, an increased modal transfer from uh, private uh, uh, cars to public transportation and greater improvements in energy performance of vehicles and of the transportation sector in general. Now let's come to Germany and let, let's look at the cross-sectoral analysis. First of all, the German, the German case. This is on the left-hand side, we can see the reference scenario. So we can already see that uh, already now, Germany uh, has a policy to strongly reduce uh, energy consumption by 2035. And uh, if in 2013 uh, consumption was uh, about 210 million tons of, of uh, oil equivalent, by 2035 it is expected to go down to about 170 to 175 million tons of uh, oil equivalent. In our energy efficiency scenario on the right hand side, the, this reduction is much more pronounced, much stronger, and we come down to a, to a consumption level demand level by 2035 of uh, less than of about 140 million tons of oil equivalent so the final energy consumption growth is uh, is negative obviously is a de decrease in the reference scenario of 0.7 percent per year on average over the period and uh, uh, for the energy efficiency scenario it's more than double it's uh, a decrease of 1.6 percent per year it is quite interesting to notice that the strongest decrease happens in the residential and the transportation sector in both uh, scenarios. Why? Well, simply because uh, uh, the services sector and in particular the industrial sector uh, has uh, always been a focus by uh, the main uh, players the big industries they have a specific person they always had a specific person energy consumption was very important for uh, the sector and they implemented a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, easy uh, measures already while as we know in the residential sector uh, it was much more difficult to implement them it's a much more decentralized sector and we all have a, a much to uh, a much too high um, psychological discount rate in order to implement the right policies even if they would make sense for us as well without any public intervention and so with uh, with a specific focus on uh, new policies uh, uh, targeted uh, among others in particular also to this sector which by itself does not what it should do by itself uh, the the potential and the and the catch up potential is much higher for the residential sector and also for the transportation sector uh, compared to the the uh, sectors like in industry where uh, you you already always had one person very often in charge of uh, of a company's energy consumption. Now here we can see some. Uh, uh, global trends in final energy consumption so gdp is expected to grow um, from 2013 2035 by about 25 percent and uh, any total final consumption is decreasing both in the reference scenario and in the and in the uh, energy efficiency scenario now germany is one of the countries and this was uh, was one of the the aims and the goals of uh, the the Energiewende and the and the previous policies to uh, to decouple to decouple energy consumption uh, compared to uh, economic growth. So uh, energy energy demand has already been decoupled in the past, but the idea is to decouple it even further in the in, in the future. And, uh, and we can see here the red and the, and the blue lines, which compared to the green line, which very beautifully illustrate this uh, decoupling. Um, uh, 
As a result, you can see that the final energy intensity of GDP, which is the uh, unit, uh, the, the amount of energy you need to produce to produce one unit of GDP, declines uh, strongly and declines obviously more in the uh, energy efficiency scenario compared to the uh, compared to the reference scenario. So here, with the decline of the energy intensity in the energy reference scenario represents about 1.8% uh, per year, and this decline in the energy efficiency scenario would be about 2.6% per year on average over the period. Now, the, um, you can see here that uh, the energy uh, final energy consumption by energy is changing so not only is the total the total demand uh, reducing but uh, also the 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 share the mix of uh, this uh, energy uh, sub demand is changing in uh, 2013 about 68 percent of energy final energy demand was based on fossil fuels in particular oil and gas and some coal for industry. Uh, in the reference scenario, this uh, level is expected to come to come down to 60% by 2035, while in the energy uh, efficiency scenario, it is expected to come down even much more and down to a level of 52%. So, uh, as I said earlier, uh, renewables is going to increase strongly. Here we are talking about uh, final energy demand, so not renewable. We are talking about uh, renewables like uh, wind and PV, which uh, uh, are producing electricity and therefore are secondary energy source. But we are talking about final energy, which is to say, as far as the, the renewable sector is concerned, mainly um, warm water heaters. Uh, solar solar application for warm water. Um, we can see that uh, uh, oil demand, uh, gas demand, uh, electricity demand is decreasing, but uh, as you go to a more energy efficiency scenario, which is also a scenario which is even further uh, low carbon, you, you, you go through some electrification of the economy. So uh, electricity uh, final energy sector will become in the energy efficiency scenario the second largest sector while in the reference scenario it remains the uh, gas remains the second largest uh, sector as, as far as final energy demand is concerned and electricity the third. Um, gas and oil and gas uh, reduce in market share uh, both in the reference scenario and even more so in the energy efficiency scenario while electricity market share increases and decreases more in the energy efficiency scenario for the reasons I just mentioned compared to the reference scenario. Now let's go through sector by sector the different uh, sectors. Let's start with electricity consumption. Uh, electricity consumption is uh, decreasing um, both in the reference scenario as well as in the energy efficiency scenario. In the energy efficiency scenario it decreases more even though even though, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, the the share of uh, electricity out of final energy increases, so the fact is that uh, uh, final energy demand decreases very strongly in the energy efficiency and much more so than in the reference scenario. But in both, electricity demand decreases less than primary energy. Um, on the right hand side, we can see the energy efficiency scenario by sector, by final sector, and we can see that uh, uh, the industry sector, that uh, energy consumption decreases the most in the industry sector. Um, it decreases uh, in uh, other sectors as well, but as far as uh, um, it, decreases, it decreases in the residential sector and in the uh, and in the uh, services sector as well. There's an increase in the share of, trans of transportation and a strong de decrease in the residential sector uh, of electricity in the energy efficiency scenario. 
now here we have different uh, final final energy demand sectors and uh, we can see uh, that while uh, the reference scenario could reduce about 30 million tons of oil equivalent uh, final energy demand even so over that over the this uh, 20 22 years even though gdp increases by 25 percent now where does this total this 30 30 million tons of oil equivalent decrease come from mainly from the residential sector as i mentioned earlier on uh, followed by the transportation sector i, I already explained uh, the reasons for this uh, predominant uh, share of uh, the residential and the transportation sector which contribute respectively 53 percent and 36 percent of this reduction of 30 million tons of oil equivalent this is the this is the reference scenario if we now go to the energy efficiency scenario we have a doubling we can see a doubling of the effort we can see that uh, energy demand reduces uh, not by 30 but 60 million tons of oil equivalent and again it is a residential sector which has the largest uh, a potential followed by the transportation sector, respectively 48% and 30%. If we look at different drivers, what are the drivers of uh, uh, energy demand reduction? We, we divided them into two groups. There is, uh, so we can see on the left hand side on uh, on, we can see we can see here this is a reference scenario this is the total the 30 million tons of oil equivalent energy consumption reduction the one we saw we spoke about earlier and uh, how what are the drivers for this uh, decline well on the one hand side we can see activity effect activity effect means uh, increased GDP increased uh, um, increased activity and this brings us an increase of uh, energy demand but at the same time we have uh, for each of these uh, sectors for the industry sector transportation sector services sector and household sector we have a decrease due to energy efficiency thanks to energy efficiency so the resulting the sum of these two uh, factors which uh, are going in in separate directions gives us the total 30 million tons energy demand reduction we can see uh, the very strong decrease in energy efficiency in particular in transportation and in and in households while we can see that the services sector is increasing very strongly in uh, in germany expected to increase very strongly in germany and therefore uh, additional consumption in particular of electricity and some heating for the services sector on the right hand side we see the same graph but now for the energy efficiency scenario where we start with we know that we have a 60 million tons of oil equivalent reduction of uh, energy demand by 2035 compared to 2013 and uh, this can be broken down into the two drivers activity effect and energy saving and again we can see while the activity effect is about the same the energy saving effect is much much higher and here we have a very strong additional potential for in the household sector which is uh, typically uh, the most difficult to convince to implement the changes but also in the transportation sector uh, uh, followed by the services and industry sector Now, we have here the next slide. <clears throat> this slide shows us uh, the additional energy savings in the energy efficiency scenarios compared to the reference scenario, so the delta between the two scenarios. And we can see again that uh, most of this uh, savings come from the residential sector, followed by the transportation sector, and then the services sector and industrial sector. The residential sector contributes therefore the bulk of the additional energy savings in the energy efficiency scenario where it represents about 46 percent and uh, about 23 percent uh, the relative share of uh, the final energy consumption so while while the residential sector only represents about 23 percent of the final energy consumption about half of the of the reduction of energy demand is due 
to this sector. So it has uh, twice as high an impact compared to on average the other sectors. Now, further analysis related to further sectorial analysis, sector by sector. Let's look at the residential sector. Let's go down. I mean, I told you earlier on that uh, our analysis allows to have a very detailed bottom-up uh, analysis by energy usages, uh, by final energy usages. So here in the residential sector, we can see that, uh, yes, there is a certain potential for uh, the residential sector, which is the largest one as we have seen so far, but inside uh, this uh, residential sector, it is indeed the space heating which has uh, the highest effect. 90% of the total is about space heating, uh, followed by um, water heating and other captive electricity. Captive electricity is uh, hot water, is lighting, is uh, uh, electric appliances. Um, not hot water, but lighting, electric appliances, and air conditioning. Where normally you you could use something else, but you don't use anything else. You just use electricity. Um, uh, and uh, thanks to the significant energy efficiency improvement for space heating, we can see this very strong uh, uh, decrease of uh, energy consumption per square meter. And uh, and therefore there, is, there are strong improvements in spare he space heating on the one hand side. Also the fact that uh, in Germany practically all most of new dwellings they move away from natural gas as uh, was used earlier on, but now use uh, uh, heat pumps. This also has very high uh, efficiency rates. Lighting, um, LED, LED lamps, uh, uh, and other very low efficiency uh, lighting reduce uh, very strongly energy demand, and uh, and so energy energy um, the residential sector has a very strong impact in uh, uh, in the overall in the overall reduction when we compare our two scenarios. The services sector. We can see here the uh, most of the of the change. Here we can see the the difference, the trend of the two scenarios: the reference scenario and the energy efficiency scenario, 2035 compared to 2013. And we can see that uh, um, uh, captive uh, electricity and uh, space heating represents. Uh, the two most important part of this decrease. And we can see that uh, the tons of oil equivalent per employee will decrease from slightly above 0 0.7 tons to, to below, to, to around 0 0.58 uh, tons by 2035. And this again, is achieved thanks to very high energy efficiency gains, in particular for space heating, but also but also the captive electricity. Now transportation, transportation. We we have two effects. On the one hand side, we have the effect of uh, uh, strong new uh, new regulation, also for the residential sector, also for the uh, space heating sector we, we the driver is uh, very very strong and improved uh, uh, regulation but also as far as uh, car fuel economy is concerned uh, but also model shift the idea that uh, people will uh, their policies which bring people also due to congestion but also due to policies to bring uh, people uh, marginally away from individual cars and more to uh, to public transportation uh, transportation system. Uh, we can see here uh, on the left hand side that uh, the reference scenario is already a very strong improvement, a strong reduction in energy, final energy demand. 2035 compared to 2013, and there's an additional potential for the energy efficiency scenario. Uh, most of it relates to road transportation. 
The, uh, on the right-hand side, we can see there are some modal shifts. Uh, people will use uh, less cars and more buses and, uh, and rail transportation, but we can also see that the difference is not that big. So most of the change is due to higher energy efficiency. A small part is due to modal shifts. Industry, industry. Um, there are some uh, very strong energy consuming uh, industries which have already done a lot of effort but which can continue to do important efforts. Energy uh, unit consumption of energy for the paper industry, for the cement industry, for the steel industry, which is industries which are very highly energy with, with high energy unit consumptions, uh, can still further be decreased. Uh, and they are decreased in the reference scenario, but they are, they, the assumption is made here that uh, they can be further, much further decreased in the energy efficiency scenario or, or quicker decreased. And, uh, and this uh, allows to decrease uh, energy intensity as well of the uh, industry sector, as we can see on the right-hand side of the graph the energy intensity decreases much faster and reaches a level and decreases on average 1.3 percent per year in the energy efficiency scenario compared to about uh, a decrease of one percent per year in the energy in the reference scenario now the the interesting thing of this uh, type of analysis which uh, inner data uh, produces and makes uh, available as a service uh, to its customers is that uh, you can make your own sensitivity analysis. So there are these two reference scenario and the energy efficiency scenario, but the user at the end of the day can play around with very uh, important uh, main drivers and uh, uh, change uh, some, uh, some of these. Can change uh, GDP annual rate of growth, for instance, or the yearly new dwellings or the dwellings with air conditioning in 2030, or the yearly replacement rate of service buildings, or the saturation of car ownership, and so on. The population growth, average household size by the, in 2030, and so on. The dematerialization of the economy, I'm going to give you an example later on, on, on this. In other words, the share of industry and GDP, the share of services and GDP, or, or, or uh, energy prices. You can uh, play around assuming what happens if energy prices for the industrial sector increases or decreases, in the residential sector increases or decreases, and so on. Or transportation sector, there are additional prices or, or, or fuel prices increase for whatever reason. What will be the effect on the uh, energy demand in global and per sector and per, and per usages? So just one, one example here we have on the left hand side this is the reference scenario this is uh, these are our two scenarios the reference scenario and the energy efficiency scenario with our assumptions but you may want to play around you may want to see what happens if i dematerialize even further german economy by 2030 what happens if uh, the share of industry in gdp gets reduced by 2% and the share of services in GDP by 2030 gets increased by 2%. And then you, you, we, do, we did that for you on the right hand side, but this is something you typically where you, which you can do yourself. And then you can see the difference on the right hand side graph compared to the left hand side graph. And uh, you can see that uh, industry, for instance, uh, since uh, it will represent uh, uh, a larger it will represent a, a larger share the 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 sorry the industry gets reduced so you will have a, a difference in the two uh, in industry and in the service sector on both sides you you have a, an increase you have an increase in demand for the industry sector and you have a you have a decrease a uh, much further decrease of demand in the service sector. This was uh, uh, the presentation. I thank you very much. If you have, uh, um, uh, this was, uh, this is a service which is uh, promo proposed to you by the unit uh, called uh, Energy Efficiency in Demand. 
if you have questions, you are welcome to write to the head of this unit, which is Nicolas Meret at enerdata.net. And uh, we stay available. I'm here with a colleague of mine who works in that uh, uh, unit. Her name is uh, uh, Laura Soudris. And uh, together, we are available to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Manfred, for that outstanding presentation. Um, as we shift to the question and answer um, portion, I would like to remind our attendees to please submit questions using the question pane at any time. We'll also keep several links up on the screen throughout for a quick reference that point to where to find information about upcoming and previously held webinars and how to take advantage of the Ask an Expert program. We've had some great questions from the audience already, um, so we'll use the remaining time to, um, to answer and discuss. The first question is, Manfred, um, I know you went into this a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, but can you elaborate on the techniques you use to estimate or forecast future energy efficiency for different sectors? Um, so, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the, let me just get to my slides. Um, yes, we, we have this, uh, Metro bottom-up model. And so we uh, use, on the one hand side, uh, different uses of uh, uh, energy. We start with uh, demand for lighting, demand for passenger uh, cars uh, uh, in transportation, and so on. And then uh, we have exogenous variables for socioeconomic uh, uh, variables like GDP, population, and so on. We, we have uh, very specific uh, information on technical economic uh, variables related to technologies and how they evolve uh, over time. And then, uh, and then policies, depending on what type of policies uh, uh, we implement, how fast and how quickly uh, specific targets needs to be achieved through regulation, for instance, uh, we uh, can uh, then uh, calibrate our METPRO model in order to get uh, some uh, outputs. So it's uh, a technical economic uh, uh, model which allows to use uh, uh, technologies and evolution of technologies. The As an input, we have uh, the the evolution of uh, GDP of uh, users and activities. Uh, and uh, as an output, we have uh, the uh, different uh, energy demand by sector, by users, uh, energy intensity indicators, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, energy expenses, which I did not show per household and so on. Wonderful, thank you for um, answering that. Um, our next question um, references slide 16, and Manfred, please let us know if you want us to um, pass the present presentation back to you. Um, on slide 16, the energy efficiency scenarios reflects no change in the trans um, transport sector. Can you explain why? Um, uh, the, the, uh, on slide 16, there is a change in the energy transport sector. The energy transport sector will consume much less. It just happened to be by coincidence that it, in both scenarios it's 23% of the total. But uh, it is much, much lower than in the uh, reference scenario. So the figure is much lower. It just happened to be by coincidence that the share is about the same. While the share has... Uh, uh increased for the reference scenario uh for for sorry for the the uh industry and has decreased uh, for the residential sector in other words there is a stronger uh, a stronger effort being done in the residential sector it's a less strong effort being done in the industry sector just because as i explained industry sector has done a lot of effort before and uh, it just this 23 percent just means that the reduction of effort in the transport sector are of the same order of magnitude compared to the 
total reduction of energy demand over the 20, over the 20 years time. Great, thank you so much. Um, for the next question, what is the reason that the projections for the industrial sector show relatively small decrease in energy efficiency scenario? Um, is cost effectiveness available um, interventions? So uh, there are improvements to be done and important improvements to be done in the energy, in, in the industry sector. Uh, but they are less important compared to the residential sector. And uh, the reason is that uh, uh, a lot of the easy stuff has already be, been implemented. Uh, uh, industrial sector, very often you have uh, industries and uh, very often this, for these industries, uh, energy is a very important uh, cost factor. And uh, when it is an important cost factor in the company, you have one person designated to deal with energy issues. And, uh, and so a lot of uh, the easy part have already been implemented. For in the residential sector, very often we just don't care. We have uh, uh, elect energy, electricity is a relatively little expense. We are not specialists on energy uh, most, of the, most of the time. We do not uh, try to minimize uh, and to, uh, uh, our energy expenses. And much more importantly, even if it would make a lot of sense to add uh, isolation, to, to, to invest today in something which would have a relatively short payback times. Very often we don't do it because a dollar today for us is worth more than a dollar saved in a few years time. Our psychological discount rate is, uh, is just too high. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore the, the, uh, both in the reference scenario and even more so in the energy efficiency scenario, the policies uh, focus much more on the residential sector because it is a residential sector where from a, from a cost benefit point of view, you can, uh, you can do today more at a lower cost. While in the industry sector, you can still do a lot, but uh, the cheap stuff has already been done mostly, while in the residential sector, there's still a lot of cheap stuff which you can do and which needs to be done. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, the next question is, is there some attempt to forecast scarcity of certain energies, the effect on price and the demand response to that? Sorry, can you repeat please? Yes, absolutely. Is there some attempt to forecast scarcity of certain energies, the effect on price and the demand response to that? Scarcity of energy, what? Uh, perhaps fossil fuels or other energies. Yes. Um, okay, the general point, the general answer to this question is that uh, compared to a few years ago, today we do not think we have a scarcity of primary energy. We have an oversupply of primary energy. The, one of the reasons, one of the proofs is that energy prices are very, very low. Uh, obviously, there is always a scarcity, there, but we might have uh, uh, the scarcity today and the constraint today, as we see it, is not so much the availability of primary energy, but rather the possibility to emit into the environment CO2 emissions. So we, we may need to have a stranded resources. We may need not to be allowed to use uh, all the, the primary energy, which we could use uh, cost effectively if we did not have the CO2 constraint. So the constraint today is, uh, is uh, climate, is decarbonization. And this is uh, the driver of our analysis, and this is the driver of the policies uh, being used today by the governments. Demand response, which is the second part of your question, is obviously extremely important. Um, demand response works with uh, uh, prices, uh, works, uh, uh, could work also with uh, uh, regulation, with, uh, with contract, contract-based, but uh, the, in the future with uh, in 
with a new technology with uh, uh, a technological shift and the technological and a shift of our energy system towards more and more not only decarbonized energy system but also a more digital energy system and a more decentralized energy system um, smart grids will play a more and more important role and uh, these smart grids will allow us will allow the uh, final equipment to communicate with the uh, electricity production equipment and with the network and whenever there is a bottleneck somewhere electricity prices will increase strongly and therefore there will be uh, a signal on the level at the final energy consumption equipment to reduce demand uh, in, 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 in order to equilibrate the supply and demand and to reduce the bottlenecks. Um, I think we, we are in the, at the beginning and progressively Go, going towards a fundamental shift of our energy uh, systems. These are driven on the one hand side politically, top down by our governments to decarbonize, but also bottom up by uh, markets, by technology. And this is uh, uh, the digitalization. We have uh, uh, digital technologies which are more and more available and also as a result uh, decentralization we have uh, more and more in the future we will be more and more prosumers not just consumers on the one hand side and producers on the others but we will, we will be prosumers we will be able to consume and produce electricity at the same time thanks to uh, decentralized uh, pv cells thanks to um, heat pumps, thanks to thanks to many different uh, uh, energy producing technologies, and uh, and all of this combined will make uh, energy uh, electricity demand response more important. I do not think that the challenge is uh, availability of resources. I think the challenge is uh, 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 decarbonization. We do not want to emit. Uh, we want to reduce emissions, and this will oblige us to change fundamentally our energy system. But also at the same time, we have new technologies which allow further demand response and which may, will make our efforts more easily. And a model like MedPro allows exactly to model these different components by sector, by usages, because you, you because you have this granularity of approach which you do not have in uh, with econometric model, where you you rely on econometric uh, uh, formulas which do not have the, the technological break, breakdown by use by usage by by sector as uh, this model has. We at Enerdata we also have uh, global models. We also have uh, top-down econometric models. For instance, our global pulse model, uh, which we use a lot for uh, advising governments to uh, help them in their uh, climate energy policies but then very often we combine the two and uh, we we have first a very detailed uh, energy demand assessment with our metro model which is a bottom-up technology based model very with a very high granularity and then we we calibrate based on metro the other model the pulse model which allows uh, to to have a to to play around with a lot of uh, and much more easily with price sensitivities because it is a because it is a a or because it is a uh, uh, econometric model. Thank you so much um, for our final um, audience question today. You have previously mentioned other countries where there are case studies. Are there any upcoming plans for more countries? Um, we use the the uh, MedPro program, the MedPro program on many countries around the world when we do consulting work. When we do consulting work for specific governments in order to, uh, to uh, advise them in what type of measures they should use to reduce uh, energy demand most efficiently and effectively. Uh, as far as what I have presented you today, uh, we have uh, a certain number of uh, 
countries in this service. This is a service which Enadata uh, sells. And uh, in this service today, we have six countries. And we plan to, uh, to include other uh, countries, uh, but we are still in the, in the definition phase for that. But if there are specific demands, please write us, and we will and we will uh, take into account uh, your uh, your wishes. Because obviously, we do not want to to produce services which are not uh, uh, demand, which are not uh, asked by uh, potential clients by the market. We want to be very close to the market, and therefore, if uh, uh, people think that uh, some countries are very interesting for them, we should be happy and willing to work together with uh, these people to see what we can do in order to help them. Great. Thank you again. On behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank you to our expert panelists today and to all of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return that there were some valuable insights you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solutions Center resources and services, including no-cost policy through support through our Ask an Expert service. I'd like to invite you to check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to the recording of today's presentation, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We are all... We are also now posting webinars, recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube play channel. Please allow about a week for the audio recordings to be posted. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar. <laughs>